do with the Syrian uprising. Tom Cruise has done his customary crowd charming on the red carpet at the premiere of the latest Mission Impossible film. Ghost Protocol is the fourth film in the series, but before it was screened, the actor braved the December chill to meet his fans. Rihanna Mills's report contains flash photography. Like a true action hero, Tom Cruise braved the cold of the red carpet. With no coat or gloves, he spent nearly two hours meeting his fans. Absolutely fantastic. I thought I was going to pass out, actually. It was shocking. Can't believe we were that close. I told him to pass by me to see my daughter. And then he said I was the most beautiful mother in the world. Well, I told him it was our anniversary tomorrow and he wished us a happy anniversary and shook my hand. So this is purely for the wife then, is it? Yes. <laughs> So what happens now? Your mission, should you choose to accept it. Again, Cruz is back as Ethan Hunt, but this time the Mission Impossible team are forced to try and clear their name after a bomb attack on the Kremlin. A quick clamber over the windows of the world's tallest building, just part of the day job. What was it like doing that stunt in Dubai? It was fun. Yeah, it was challenging. I know everyone was pretty nervous when we were doing it, and so but a lot went into it to try to make it as safe as possible. His co-stars are so impressed, it seems it was a bit of a love-in on set. I love Tom. I, I, I'm, you know, he's infinitely impressive as a human being. He's just the, the most sort of committed guy in terms of his, his dedication to his work. He really cares what people get from the films he makes. He puts everything into them. And you can't help when you're working with him to just do the same thing. You have to raise your game. There's no doubt that a good old Tom Cruise walkabout will always pull in the fans, but what the movie makes will be hoping now is that this, the fourth in the series, will also achieve the almost impossible and pull in the fans at the box office. One that's sure to fill cinema seats is, of course, another Top Gun. He's not ruling out returning to the skies. We've been working on it, and Tony, I never thought we'd do it, but Tony, Scott, the director, you know, and uh, Jerry and I, we were talking about stuff. We thought, well, you know what? I see where we are right now, and to get an opportunity flying the, that aircraft, you know, the only way I'll do it is if we really crack the story and I get to fly in that. So it's all about getting back in the plane then. It's all about getting back in that airplane. Make no mistake about it. And no doubt if more stunts are on offer, he will choose to accept them. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News in central London. The latest instalment of Tom Cruise's Mission Impossible movie uh, having its London premiere tonight at the IMAX Theatre in central London. The uh, star, as always, uh, very good to the crowds. He's been working the red carpet, talking to the crowds, having his picture taken. Rhiannon Mills is there in cruise control. Uh, well, Tom Cruise, yes. you are in demand tonight. I'm in here, you, you, in London. <laughs> you've been on the red carpet since about quarter past five. It's freezing, you don't have gloves on, you've only got a jumper on. Is it worth it though? Yeah, it's really nice. I mean, it doesn't feel too cold to me. So, How are all the fans though? Really lovely, really lovely. Yeah. So, so tell us about this, the fourth Mission Impossible film, watched it today. Again, you're doing those stunts, so you haven't kind of hung up those action hero clothes yet? No, uh, no, not yet, not yet. We'll still hold on to them for a little bit. What's so special about the Mission Impossible franchise, do you think? It was the first film that I ever produced and, uh, you know, to act in them and to produce them, they're just they're a lot of fun to work on and it's, it's uh, you know, you get big action and, and a big story and this one, I'm very proud of it. We all worked very hard on it. It's very, it's got a lot of humor and just big entertainment. And you keep pushing the boundaries with the technology, with hanging onto the side of the birds, Khalifa. Stunts, yeah. <laughs> and what was it like doing that stunt in Dubai? It was fun. Yeah, it was challenging. I know everyone was pretty nervous when we were doing it, and so, but a lot went into it to try to make it as safe as possible. And I knew, you know, I, I love uh, the IMAX format. I knew we were going to shoot in IMAX, and, and the preparation for it was, you know, very detailed and thorough. And then when the days came, we were shooting. IMAX. It was, it was pretty how much dynamic, to say the but, least. Um, how does it feel that all these people continue to come out? You've almost got that reputation now that you're going to be there, you're going to be signing those autographs. It's really nice. It really is wonderful, actually. It's, I don't expect it, and it's very special. I can't wait for them to see it in IMAX here tonight. And tell us, uh, Top Gun 2, there have been kind of rumours there might be another Top Gun. Can we wait for it? Is it coming? 
Go on, tell us. You know, if I could figure it out. We've been we've been working on it, and Tony, I never thought we'd do it, but Tony, Scott, the director, you know, and uh, Jerry and I we were talking about stuff. We thought, well, you know what? I see where we are right now, and to get an opportunity flying the, that aircraft. You know, the only way I'll do it is if we really crack the story and I get to fly in that story. So it's all about getting back in the plane then? It's all about getting back in that airplane. Make no mistake about it. <laughs> Thank you very much tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. You Thank too. you. Bye-bye. Rihanna, uh, you saw the movie today. Uh, it sounds pretty good and uh, he's obviously fairly excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. I was watching the film today and he's still very much doing those stunts, incredible things, hanging off the side of, of the uh, tallest building in the world. And this is obviously going to, hopefully, uh, going to be another big Christmas box office uh, smash. It's 26th of December, it's going to be released. Obviously, it's always difficult when you have a series of films coming out, uh, continuing, trying to kind of top the last one. But there's no doubt they will be hoping that, that once again they can get the, 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 the box office and numbers up and get people coming back. You can see he's a very popular guy. All the fans have been, been mad sort of around here, uh, getting him to sign autographs, getting him to sign DVDs, and um, yeah, having, it, having a good chat with all the fans here. Tell us a bit more about it. I mean, there's some very nice pictures of him. Uh, he seems to spend more time with the crowds, uh, signing autographs, chatting to them, having his picture taken than just about anybody else we ever see on a red carpet, doesn't he? Well, that's what I was saying to him earlier. He doesn't even have any gloves on. He hasn't got his winter coat on. He's here in his smart suit jacket and his jumper. And, um, and he's... He's still happy to meet as many fans as possible, and I think uh, that is refreshing. He sort of obviously said to me earlier that he doesn't expect people to turn out, doesn't expect the attention, um, but clearly people still want to come out and see him. I was talking to him there about about the um, the Top Gun film. Him saying, "Yeah, definitely, he wants to do. It. He wants to get on board," and I'm sure loads of people will be very pleased to hear it. And. Um, yeah, still wants to do those stunts, still wants to uh, impress people as well as produce the films as well. Lovely, thanks very much indeed, uh, Rian. There's Simon Pegg, who's playing an unexpected uh, serious role in a <coughs> serious film, not like his usual comedies, um, including, of course, Shaun of the Dead, where he uh, co-starred with me, which was very nice. Um, Tom Cruise in uh, Top Gun 2, where he becomes probably a commercial airline pilot. We shall find out more in the fullness of time. Now, the Met Office issues a severe weather warning for the whole of the UK. This is Sky News with Stephen Dixon. Very good morning. Nick Clegg has hit out at Eurosceptics for provoking xenophobia in the wake of the crisis in the Eurozone. It comes with tension still running high between Britain and France over comments by the French Prime Minister attacking the British economy. Also this morning, one of the world's leading credit rating agencies has warned a comprehensive deal to save the Eurozone from calamity is probably beyond reach. Well, our senior correspondent Ian Woods is in Paris for us this morning, but first to Rhiannon Mills, who's in Westminster. And what exactly, Rhiannon, has the Deputy PM been saying? Well, we had those strong words from Nick Clegg yesterday saying that the comments coming from across the channel from France were unacceptable. But I think today he seems to have cooled down a little, realising that actually the spat that's going on across the channel could well be playing into the hands of Eurosceptics. In his latest comments, he said that the danger at the moment is because society is under economic stress, xenophobia, chauvinism and polarisation increase. You can see it in British politics. This is the perfect environment if you are UKIP leader Nigel Farage or SNP leader Alex Salmond, the people who are trying to exploit the politics of grievance and blame, they believe they've got the wind in their sails. Now it's clear that the Deputy Prime Minister has presumes that his comments that he made yesterday may well also be playing into their hands. He does also though go on in this interview to say that uh, in the past it's almost been a sport for France and the UK to take a pop at each other but eventually in the end everyone has agreed that it's better to work together. Well to Paris then and our senior correspondent Ian Woods. Is this being seen as a bit of a sport over there Ian? Are there real international concerns about any sort of Words. 
Nick Clegg attacks xenophobic Eurosceptics as international concern grows over the fallout between Britain and France. David Cameron calls for return of traditional Christian values to counter Britain's moral collapse. Booze Britain paramedics battle with a surge in public drunkenness on one of the busiest nights of the year. And the big freeze. The Met Office issues a severe weather warning for the whole of the UK. This is Sky News with Stephen Dixon. Very good morning. Nick Clegg has hit out at Eurosceptics for provoking xenophobia in the wake of the crisis in the Eurozone. It comes with tensions still running high between Britain and France over comments by the French Prime Minister attacking the British economy. Also this morning, one of the world's leading credit rating agencies has warned that a comprehensive deal to save the Euro from calamity is probably beyond reach. Let's go live to Westminster. Sky's Rihanna Mills is standing by for us. Uh, it seems to be pretty strong words coming from Nick Clegg this morning, Rhianne. And what exactly has he been saying? Yes, outspoken yesterday about comments coming from France saying they were unacceptable. Today, he appears to have cooled down somewhat, uh, realising that actually this spat that's going on across the channel could be playing into the hands of Eurosceptics. In this interview, he said that the danger at the moment is because society is under economic stress, xenophobia, chauvinism and polarisation increase. You can see it in British politics. This is the perfect environment if your UKIP leader, Nigel Farage, your SNP leader, Alex Salmond, the people who are trying to exploit the politics of grievance and blame, they believe they've got wind in their sails. Now, clearly, he doesn't want this to happen. He may have been outspoken yesterday about uh, the comments that were coming from France. However, he has also said that in the past, it's almost been sport, really, for uh, France and Britain to have a pop at each other. But actually, in the end, everyone has agreed that it's better to work together. There's not much sport in it, though, at the minute, is there, Rhiannon, with uh, what's been happening over the past 10 days or so between Britain and France? Are there now real international concerns about this spat? But with this financial crisis ongoing in Europe, there's no doubt that around the world we're being looked at in terms of what's being said on both sides of the channel. Uh, the latest that we've heard from is the head of the World Bank, Robert Zerlick. Now, he said, I've been deeply troubled over the past couple of days to see some of the commentary going across the English Channel, not only comments from France, but also from Brussels. If the process that evolves out of Europe starts to create a deeper acrimony with Britain, I don't think this is good for where the European Union will go. I don't ultimately think it's good for Britain. Now, you have to remember, this comes at a time when the ratings agencies are really piling the pressure on the Eurozone countries. Uh, you have to remember, France are particularly worried about their credit rating. Uh, Standard & Poor's have said in the States that they are looking at a number of different European countries. And yesterday, while Fitch, the credit rating, said that they would be keeping, well, keeping France's triple A rating, they did go on to say that they had turned the outlook to negative. You also have to remember that it's Fitch who've said that a comprehensive Eurozone deal is beyond reach. There are others out there who'll be hoping that's not the case. OK, Rhiannon, thank you. Let's take you live to Paris, our senior correspondent. ...with the official government forecast from the uh, Office for Budget Responsibility that, uh, that will be a centrepiece of the Chancellor's statement. The difficulty is that, of course, from George Osborne's point of view and from the point of view of the government, is that if, they, uh, if growth is going to be sig significantly lower than he had anticipated, that means that he will have to borrow more, a lot more, probably tens of billions of pounds uh, more than he might have expected even six months or, uh, or a year ago. And that uh, presents him, obviously, with uh, significant uh, difficulties going forward. Uh, uh, though when we spoke to the Chancellor, he was out and about uh, earlier on this morning trumpeting his new scheme for uh, money to be pumped into infra infrastructure spending, uh, he still feels that the government is very much on the right track. Well, we're setting our plans today for £30 billion of investment in our country's infrastructure, in its roads, in its railways, in its schools. Some of that money will come from the government, from savings we're going to identify, and I'll set those out tomorrow. Much of it's going to come from the private sector, from pension funds. So we use British savings to invest in British jobs and British building. 
So I think it's the right thing to do at a time like this. We've got to take our country through these difficult times. We've got to weather the storm. We've also got to lay the foundations of future economic success. We're so used to hearing about cutbacks, though, at the moment. Do we have the money to afford this infrastructure investment? Well, investing in Britain's economic future is the priority for this government. And we are finding the resources in difficult times to build the roads, to build the railways. Here we're talking about an extension of the tube line that could create 25,000 jobs on this site. We're doing these things because Britain has got to get away from the quick fix debt solutions that got us into this mess. We've got to weather the current economic storm, but we've got to lay the foundations for a stronger economic future. We've got to make sure that British savings in things like pension funds are deployed here and British taxpayers' money is well used. You talk about that current economic storm. Today, the OECD say that we're heading for another recession. Uh, is it time for a complete change of tack? Have you got it wrong? Well, of course, we will set out tomorrow the government's own independent forecasts for the economy. But what is clear from the OECD is that these are very difficult economic times for many countries in the Western world. And the OECD is predicting deep recessions in many European countries. That is a challenge for Britain. Now, what we can do with our policies of dealing with our debts is we can take Britain safely through this storm. And that is, of course, a key priority. But we've also, at the same time, got to lay the foundations for future economic success and you see here at Battersea you see up in uh, the train line between Manchester and Leeds which the Prime Minister is visiting today as well the kind of projects that we're going to be supporting and just finally tomorrow it's a big day it's a big week uh, how convinced are you that you can still win over the public convince them that you are in charge of this that you can turn things around Look, I think the public understand that Britain has huge debts that it's built up those debts need to be dealt with the public also understand that the Eurozone makes that more difficult. But what they want the government to do is stick to the plan that will take us safely through the storm and invest for the long-term future. They have had enough of politicians who think there is a quick-fix solution, who say you can borrow a bit more to get us out of debt. They know the public that this is not the answer for Britain. And as, as a result, actually, I think the public is behind what the government's doing. The Chancellor of the Exchequer there speaking a little bit earlier, reflecting uh, on, amongst other things, that OECD uh, report uh, on Britain's future. There's our economics editor. Uh, to really work together to address this because mm -hmm. ultimately you are seeing people having their gas disconnected, their electricity disconnected. Um, and in, in households, mm -hmm. particularly households where you've got people with young children or you've got people with disabilities, for instance, or you've got older people, it is a really serious problem. Well, Sky's Rhiannon Mills joins us live from central London now. And Rhiannon, what's the, the major reason for people falling into fuel poverty? Is it simply the price increases? Well, it may have been fairly mild over the last few months, but really these figures do give you a staggering idea of just how many families really are still struggling to pay those gas and electricity bills and also that regional split across the country that's going on. To give you a breakdown of a few more figures, uh, almost a third of Welsh households are fuel poor. This means that they spend 10% or more of their net monthly income on energy bills. The average energy bill in Wales for a year is just over £1,300 and also also in the east of England, they're not far behind either, also considered a fuel poor region. Now this, you have to remember, doesn't include those recent rises that we've heard about in energy bills, so those figures could be even higher. It'll also be a big embarrassment for the government who for years have been trying to bring down the levels of fuel poverty. In fact, they are still committed to trying to end fuel poverty by 2016. And uh, Rhiannon, we know that Wales has been particularly hard hit. What are they doing there to combat the problem? Well, it's interesting. Today we've uh, come across a poster which has been put up in schools uh, asking children to do what they can to hopefully uh, cut fuel poverty in their own homes. A few tips that we could uh, probably all deal with. Um, wear the right clothes, for example. Eat hot food, drink warm drinks, get out and exercise, keep a blanket handy. Uh, things like keeping doors and windows closed. But it's clear that many people out there will be saying, actually, what we need is a cut in those fuel bills. As you were saying there, over the last five years, bills on average have gone up by 88%. So many people out there will say that actually it's more than a hot drink and a pair of socks that they need to see them through this winter. OK, Rhiannon, for the moment, thank you very much.
A mother has said she feared she wouldn't survive to see her children again after a stone block was dropped onto her car. 40 minutes later, another woman was seriously injured when a large piece of concrete was dropped onto her vehicle from a different bridge but on the same stretch of road. Police are treating both incidents as attempted murder. Sky's Rhianna Mills reports. Lisa and Stella Horn were simply heading back from Christmas shopping. They believe they're lucky they made it home alive. It was just as if somebody had put their hands over my eyes, and then I just heard a bang and my windscreen just shattered. Um, I sort of can't really remember pulling over or anything, but just remember stopping um, on the hard shoulder, um, getting out of the car and obviously seeing, seeing what had happened and realising that something could come off the bridge. This is the lump of granite rock that was thrown onto their car, exploding through the windscreen as they drove along the A12 in Essex underneath this bridge. I don't think I'd be driving in the dark. Um, I certainly won't be going down the A12. Um, and I'm scared um, that I may never have come home to my children. I've got two young children, so it's, it's scared me a lot and it's made me realise how precious life is, really. I feel like somebody was looking over me, yeah, and... Obviously, if I was going any faster, it may have been a different story. And, yeah, I do feel very lucky. The attacker on Thursday night would have been hidden in the dark. But because this is such a busy road, police are hoping there may have been a number of witnesses. They say it's incredibly lucky that Lisa and her mum weren't hurt. Another woman wasn't so fortunate. Just 40 minutes later, a huge lump of concrete was thrown from another bridge and landed on this car leaving the 57-year-old female passenger in hospital with a fractured face and ribs and internal injuries. I just don't know how they went home that night and slept. How, how, or even, or how could they just go home and sleep when they could have killed four people within half an hour and just go home and sleep and I don't understand. Over the past three years, there have been 30 incidents like this. Police say there are a few similarities and aren't ruling out they could be linked with these latest attacks. Well, Rhiannon's on the A12 in Essex for us now. And what about what you were just saying in that report, Rhianna? The concern from Essex police that these may not be isolated incidents. Well, with talk of those incidents in the past, you do get the sense there is a level of concern that this kind of incident could happen again. You have to remember that Thursday night's attacks are both being treated as attempted murder. Certainly today, we've seen police putting up those witness boards, increasing those patrols on the A12, and also desperately trying to trace those missiles, as they call them, trying to find out whether maybe lumps of concrete have been stolen from people's back gardens. Now, local people certainly seem to be responding to their appeals. Last night, there were reports that a man was on a bridge with a lump of concrete. That actually turned out to be a false alarm. However, police say that it's going to be tip-offs like that, uh, things from local people, which will ultimately prevent this from happening again. OK, Rhiannon, thank you. Ivory Coast. There you are. As well. there we go. Let's talk about homelessness, homelessness now, because that uh, comes to mind this time of the year. Um, homeless people are dying around 30 years sooner than those of you with a roof over your head because new research by Crisis, which is a homeless charity, has revealed men sleeping rough are only living to an average age of 47. For women, that's 43. You compare that to the national average, that's 77. Drugs and alcohol account for more than a third of all these deaths on the street. Suicide is also nine times more likely and dying in a traffic accident or by falling over three times more likely if you are homeless. Rhiannon Mills with the report. Have a Merry Christmas, ladies. At 25, Matt says he has no choice but to live on the streets. A family breakup has already forced him to sleep rough in Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester and now London. A few streets away, we also found Jonathan, left begging after losing his council house. Both know that life on the streets can ultimately be a killer. Everything from fights to stabbings to drug use to solvent abuse to murders to overdosing, suicides, there's, there's literally no limit. They say that uh, it's one of the least painful ways to, to die is to die of the cold because you don't really feel it, you just sort of go numb. So uh, it doesn't bother me either too much.
Their stories back up the latest research from Charity Crisis, hoping it's going to be a wake-up call at this, their busiest time of year. Living on the street is not only cold, uncomfortable, it's dangerous. Uh, and it clearly is a danger to health. If you wanted to compare that group uh, with, a, with something else, you'd end up comparing it, for example, to someone like Mali. Um, you know, it's the same kind of population and the uh, age of death of a country that's hugely underdeveloped. The Streetlights project is just one of those that offers support and all important food. The dozens of meals that they hand out here every single week are of course vital for those who are sleeping rough but still trying to stay fit and healthy. They do their best here to get people off the streets but they know that living on the streets will forever continue to have an impact on many people's lives. Two years ago, drink and drug problems left Julian Daly homeless. He believes that it's emotional scars that are often hardest to heal. He's now training to be a counsellor. A gentleman I spoke to today, he was doing drink, who wants to get off it. But everybody else has refused to help, and I spoke to him about that. And he's giving him some hope, and that's a good thing to do. You know, giving someone an idea that there isn't, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Excuse me, mate, do you want a sandwich? Yeah, I don't want a <laughs> like cup of tea? I love a cup of tea. Do you want coffee? Of course, there is always goodwill, but charities like Crisis want a change at the top. Laws to force local authorities to offer emergency housing and better medical services. Maybe then a short-term problem won't leave people like Matt facing a long-term nightmare. Have a Merry Christmas, folks. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News in central London. A lot of troubled headlines in at the Oscars. And East meets West, or the West End at least, Asian tourists making the most of the sales. That's coming up in our paper review with Liz and Ollie fairly shortly. First, though, let's update you on our top story. Eleven people in custody this morning after an 18-year-old boy was murdered on Oxford Street during one of the busiest shopping days of the year. Pictures posted on the internet show hundreds of people watching as police and paramedics try to save the victim's life. Later, there was a second stabbing on the same street, and police are investigating whether the two incidents are linked. This report now from Rhiannon Mills. As a teenager lay dying on one of London's busiest streets, police did all they could to keep the crowds back. On the road, emergency crews can be seen battling to resuscitate him and treat his stab wounds. Officers above fight to keep control. One appears to pull a taser, warning off those who try to get too close. While others attempted to calm those who were clearly in distress. It was just after lunchtime the excitement of the Boxing Day sales was shattered. It's thought the 18-year-old may have been stabbed after a fight broke out between two groups of youths, possibly in a row over a pair of trainers. But just after six in the evening, a few hundred yards away, a second man was stabbed close to Oxford Circus. He was treated for leg wounds but not believed to be seriously injured. Police say it's too early to say if the incidents are linked. As the festive lights are still hanging over Oxford Street, the police are clearly making every effort possible to try and clear the road where the 18-year-old was left dying. They say that once the crowds left, they found a number of weapons. They don't know yet whether they have found that murder weapon. But as those investigations go on, so does the effort to reassure shoppers, telling them that they are safe despite these two stabbing incidents on one of the busiest days of the year. Oxford Street is set to reopen this morning, just in time for the sales to continue. Police know the horror of yesterday will have shocked many, but the thousands who simply came out shopping are now potential eyewitnesses and could be vital to their investigations. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News, Oxford Street. Good morning, and the inquiry into ethics in the media prompted by the phone hacking scandal gets underway today. Lawyers representing Hugh Grant and the parents of Madeleine McCann and Millie Dowler will be among those at the High Court for the start of the inquiry, led by Lord Justice Leveson. Rhiannon Mills has this report. This inquiry was sparked by a summer of scandal. Outcry over Millie Dowler's phone being hacked, resignations, a newspaper closed and claims that illegal snooping went further than the news of the world. 
Lord Justice Leveson will oversee the hearings, backed up by a panel of experts from areas of law, media, politics and the police. Speaking earlier this year, he said it was time to put personal opinions to one side. It may be tempting for a number of people to close ranks and suggest that the problem is or was local to a small group of journalists then operating the news of the world. But I would encourage all to take a wider picture of the public good and help me grapple with the length, width and depth of the problem as it exists. The first phase will focus on relationships between the press and the public, as well as newspaper links with police and politicians. They'll also cover how the press is regulated. Later hearings will then discuss phone hacking at News International and whether the illegal practices went further. Among those expected to take part are Lord Prescott, Hugh Grant, the Dowler family, Kate and Jerry McCann and the author J.K. Rowling. At the Society of Editors' annual conference, talk of a turbulent 12 months couldn't be avoided. Many still want self-regulation. The Leveson inquiry is very useful, um, uh, more useful, I think, to uh, the politicians and the chattering classes than it is to the media. Uh, but now it's here, uh, we have to embrace it and we have to go with it and we have to make sure that they come to the right conclusions. Inside of Court 73 over the coming weeks, we can expect to hear from a steady stream of news editors, MPs and celebrities, all helping the inquiry team to dissect what exactly was going on inside those newsrooms and potentially how far those murky practices spread. But that will take some time with the inquiry due to run until the end of February. With criminal investigations ongoing, those involved know the questioning can only go so far, but that may not stop stories emerging some in the newspaper industry never wanted us to hear. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News.